All right, guys, welcome to part five of impairment of assets, A36. Uh, today, we're just going to, to take a look at reversal, impairment reversals uh, and also look at an, a worked example and take a look at a worked example. So uh, we already passed through this objective scope, uh, definitions, impairment, uh, measurement of recoverable amount that is fairly to sell as well as value news. We covered all that, recognizing impairment loss within the financial statements indicators of impairment like both external and internal in annual impairment review and then uh, let's go today on the topic reversals of impairment laws then after this page just from here to here we'll go to a worked example so what do we mean by reverse of impairment as i told you that uh, there is an impairment loss when uh, the recoverable amount is less than actually the, the carrying amount but what if uh, it happened that the carrying amount is much higher than the recoverable amount? Sorry, it, what, what happens when the recoverable amount is more than the uh, carrying amount, but there was previous impairment? If there was previous, previous impairment, that means we wrote down the, the, the value of the asset. And so if there is an improvement, that is the recoverable amount exceeds the carrying amount, we have a uh, to recover back, we have to raise uh, the value of the assets. But there is a cap. There is a limit to which uh, we could raise the value of the asset. So it really depends on the situation. So here the explanations come. We are told that the calculation of impairment loss is based on predictions of what may happen in the future. Actual events may turn out to be better than predicted, at which point the recoverable amount is recalculated and the previous write down reversed. So it could happen that you have checked uh, the recoverable amount and that the recoverable amount, let's say today, uh, I used value news. You know, when speaking, if you, are, if you want to compute impairment loss today, you compute the recoverable amount. That includes several less costs to sell, but also it includes value news. Now, by value news, we take the present value of future cash flows. So it may, it may happen that we wrongly predicted the future cash flows, and that made us to, to, to find that there was an impairment. But actually, when time goes on, we could get the right, uh, the right predictions, and that could show us that uh, actually the recoverable amount is much higher than the carrying amount, calling for the reversal of the impairment loss. So let's proceed here. So here we are told that impaired assets should be reviewed at each. Now you have to know this is the main point. This is the main point. Impaired assets should be reviewed at each reporting date to see whether there are indicators that impairment has reversed. Now, as opposed to impairment loss, you know, impairment loss are uh, actually to obtain impairment loss, you have to perform impairment. You have to perform impairment review. But to perform impairment review, first there have to be conditions for impairment. But when the asset is impaired, when the asset is impaired, we have to conduct impairment review, impairment reversal review at the end of each period, at least at the end of each period. So the asset which has been impaired, as you wrote here, should be reviewed at each reporting date to see whether there has been a reversal of impairment, just like that. And here comes, we are told, a reversal of impairment loss is recognized immediately as income in profit or loss. A reversal of impairment is recognized directly in the statement of profit or loss. What do I mean by this? What do I mean by uh, recognizing it? Let me explain a bit here before going to an example. Uh, let's say, let's say you you have you had your you have your asset and your asset had the previous impairment loss of had suffered previous impairment loss of twenty million. Let's say it's something like that, and then at the end uh, at the end of the, of another period, let's say this now now the end of the period, I need to to come to to check whether since the asset was impaired, I need to to perform impairment review to see whether there has been an impairment reversal. So, you know, to check for impairment, you compare two things. To check for impairment review, two things. Carrying amount, let's assume the carrying amount is 100 million. Let's ask the recoverable amount. Let's say uh, we have the recoverable, recoverable amount is uh, the amount is, let's say, uh, 130. 
let's say something like this. So here we, we discover that the asset was previously impaired for 20 million. But now in the books, it is recorded at 100, but actually it could recover up to 130. Since you can recover more than what is actually recorded in the books, that means there has been an impairment reversal. So we have to raise it. Now, not one thing. It does not necessarily mean that we have to raise it from 100 to 130. No, it's not like that. Actually, the value should not exceed the recoverable amount, but also we raise it by this amount. We can raise it by the maximum of 20 million. We cannot raise it by the maximum of 20 million, which is the previous impairment losses, even if they are accumulated. So you could say here, the reversal, the reversal possible equals 130 million minus 100 million, which is 30 million. Actually, you can reverse by 30 million, but there is a cap. The maximum amount we can reverse is 20 million. So we could not raise more than 30 million. So just like that, it's easy. You can just compare this. Compare impairment loss 20 million. The difference 30 million. You take the lesser. So you increase the value of the asset by 20 million. We say 20, 30 million versus 20 million. And then you take the lower amount. You take the lower amount like this which would be 20 million. So your asset that is recorded at 100 million will be increased by 20 million. How do we increase the value of our asset? Asset has a debit nature. So to increase it, uh, I'll have to debit that asset by 20 million. And then the value of the asset has increased, you call this impairment reversal. Impairment reversal, that is, that goes to the statement of profit or loss, 20 million. So we do something like this. So this is how we deal with impairment reversals. Actually, I will go further and look at how to deal with impairment reversals when the asset is revalued. For revalued assets, I want you to understand one thing. We will also take a look at how to deal with the revalued assets, but for now, uh, no much consideration is needed. So I hope you have got me up to here and I, I hope that we can proceed. So let's proceed before going to an example. So that's why we say a reverse of impairment loss is recognized immediately as income in profit or loss. If the original impairment was charged against the revaluation surplus, now this is what I was speaking about. Uh, from I-16, you know, we know you, you have to understand this. For revalued assets, for assets under revaluation model, if an asset is impaired, but it was previously revalued upwards, that impairment is treated as a revaluation loss. And we know that revaluation loss in general is taken to the statement of profit or loss, unless it is reversing the previous revaluation gain. So that's why you're told, if the original impairment was charged against revaluation surplus, you know, if we charge the impairment against the revaluation surplus, that means that impairment was taken to the other comprehensive income is a revaluation loss. And if it was taken to the other comprehensive income, even this reverse of impairment will also be taken to the other comprehensive income rather than to the profit or loss. So that's what you're saying. If the original impairment was charged against the revaluation surplus, it is recognized as other comprehensive income and that's credited to revaluation reserve. It's very much obvious if we take it to other comprehensive income in the reverse of revaluation gain, that means it will go to the revaluation reserve or revaluation surplus that is equity in the statement of financial position. So here we proceed. All right, we are told here that uh, the reversal must not take place, must not take the value of the asset above its depreciated historical cost. You know, this is what I was speaking about now. If you reverse uh, the value of the asset, if you reverse the value of the asset, if you reverse the impairment, that value should not go, that impairment reversal should, should not make it that the value of the asset goes about above its depreciated historical cost. Depreciated historical cost, that means even if the asset is under evaluation model, would not consider evaluation. 
Actually, we're gonna see this. We're gonna see this in an, in an example shortly. So we say the amount it would have, that this depreciated historical cost is the amount it would have been if the original impairment had not been recorded. So the depreciation that would have been charged in the meantime must be taken into account. Just like that. Actually, you're gonna see an example. Uh, it's very simple. So let's proceed here. We are told that the depreciation charge for future periods should be revised to reflect the change carrying amount. This is very much obvious actually. Because after, after, after obtaining the new cost, you actually also have to compute the new depreciation. This is obvious, no issue. So let's finish up here and see the indicators and then go to an example. Be patient a bit, a bit more. Note, however, that the impairment loss recognized for goodwill cannot be reversed in the subsequent periods. Now, this uh, is just an exception, but actually, this is just the topic of impairment. But we know, you have to understand that impairment loss recognized for goodwill is never reversed even if there seem to there seems to be an impairment reversal we cannot reverse the impairment loss for goodwill you know why if actually the value has risen if actually the recover amount has risen meaning that there has been an impairment reversal we believe that it is the new goodwill that has been formed not that we have uh, recovered not we have reversed the impairment for the previous goodwill so that's why goodwill is never involved even when uh there have been an impairment reversal it will be the actually the coming of the new goodwill that's why explanations say this is because once purchased goodwill has become impaired any subsequent increase in its recoverable amount is likely to be an increase in internally generated goodwill. This is new goodwill. And we know that internal is per aesthetic of intangible assets. Internally generated goodwill should not be recognized, is not recognized in the books. So that's why you do nothing for goodwill. Rather than a reversal of the impairment loss recognized for the original purchase goodwill. As I said, internally generated goodwill cannot be recognized. So this is the main reason that when the, there is an impairment reversal and the goodwill was impaired, you cannot reverse that impairment by and take and and, re, and, re, and recognize back your goodwill because that goodwill will be an internal a new goodwill that is an internally generated goodwill which is never recognized in the financial statements. Just like that, right? So let's see uh, the indicators here up to here. And before going to cash generating, gener cash generating units, we'll go to one example and see how to deal with impairment reversal. So here we are told indicators of impairment reversal. Now we have internal and external indicators as well as internal indicators. It's just like uh, when you did uh, the indicators of impairment, external and internal. You can, we could go back to the video about videos uh, about part of the videos to take a look at this. So it's just as I just told you, indicators of impairment reverse. So simply speaking, uh, if you need uh, to make matters simple, when we say impairment reverse, we just mean this. You know, we usually compare the carrying amount versus the recoverable amount. The carrying amount versus the recoverable amount or amount. Now, if you compare these two amounts here and you come to recoverable amount, recoverable amount is taken in the higher of fair value, less cost to sell, and value in use. Value in use. Now, by speaking of value in use here, if you say that in an impairment reversal, that means recoverable amount is greater than the carrying amount. Now you just take look, take a look at these factors. What would happen that these values are greater such that they could exceed the carrying amount? For example, let's say if increase in market value because market value increases, the fair value would increase. Let's say about value news, you know value news is taken as the present value of future cash flows. Let's say you have changed the use of the asset into a better use such, such that uh, much higher cash flows are generated. Let's say uh, there have been a fall in interest rates. You know, the fall in interest rates would lead to a decrease in the discount rate. If the discount rate decreases, considering the time value of money in the form of a present value, that means future values would be discounted in a much lesser way, such that the value news would be higher. So 
when, need, when in need of learning these indicators, it's just very simple. Just refer to here and you'll understand each and everything by yourself. So that's why we say increasing the asset's market value. That means fair value will increase. And so the asset, we could recoup much more from the asset. Now, favorable changes in the technological market, economic, or legal environment. Let's say there have been uh, changes uh, in the external environment such that uh, the asset can now generate a much more amount. Let's say there is a following interest rate. The following interest rates mean that means a, a lower discount rate, and they mean that their uh, future values would be reduced much less, meaning that the value news would be higher just like that, and we go to internal indicators. Now, as for internal indicators, we are told fair, favorable changes in the use of the asset. If you have favorable changes in the use of the asset, let's say you're using it for, for maybe you, you had your asset, and, and let's say we are using your asset for, let's say what? Let's say you are using your asset as an investment property, or maybe you are using that your asset as a PPE, is owner occupied, but now you are using it as, a, as an investment property, and it is generating much more amount, we could say that our impairment could have reversed, but also improvements in the asset's economic performance. Let's say the asset itself uh, has just improved the performance. Let's say you did a major repair to the asset and the asset now brings up much more amount, much more cash flow to the entity. Now let's go directly to a worked example and see how to proceed. Let's go to an example on reverse of impairment reverse of impairment, let's go to an example. For all these above examples, go to the above lectures. You'll find each and everything, all explanations. So here, I think we are here. Here we are. Question number three. Now read the question. First of all, you can check out the required, what are required to do. Explain supporting computations, the impact on the financial statements of the two impairment reviews. Two impairment reviews were, were performed. Now you do not know whether there was an impairment reversal, whether there was an impairment loss or there was nothing. We have to read for ourselves and figure that out. So we are told, LK purchased an uncurrent asset on 1st January 20X2 at a cost of 30 million. This was the original cost at which the asset was purchased, an uncurrent asset. And that at that date, the asset had an estimated useful life of 10 years. We are given the useful life of 10 years. Now we are told here that LK does not revalue this type of asset, but accounts for it on the basis of depreciated historical cost. So the good thing is that the asset is in value isn't and used under the revaluation model. So no revaluation model here. And then we are told here that at the first December, at the first December 2083, that is uh two years later, because 20x2 has ended. 23 has also ended. We are told that the asset was subject to an impairment review and had a recoverable amount of 18 million, just like this. So the asset had a recoverable amount of 18 million, but now that two years have passed. Now, before proceeding here, you could just take a look up to here first. If you go up to here, you can check something. We are, all right, we are told that at the first December 26, three years later, the circumstances which caused the original impairment to be recognized have reversed and are no longer applicable. With the result, now the recovery amount is now 40 million. No circumstances have changed. Now let's start with that one, the first one. Here, we performed impairment review and we figured out the recovery amount to be 18 million. Now up to here, since there was an impairment review, we have to compare recovery amount and the carrying amount. So since we have recovery amount is 18 million, let's compute the carrying amount. So how do you obtain the carrying amount at that first December 23? You have our cost at first January 20X2, and then we'll subtract uh, the accumulated depreciation up to that point. Now the cost of the asset was 30 million. It had a useful life of uh, 10 years, no residual value. So using the straight line method, you take depreciation, a 30 million minus zero over 10 years, that is depreciation for one year. So since two years have passed, you multiply it by two, and you end up with 6 million. So 6 million would be the accumulated depreciation for 20x2 as well as 20x3. If you subtract 30 million minus 6 million, you remain with 24 million, which is a carrying amount. So this would be your carrying amount here. And then you compare the carrying amount with the recovery amount, which was 18 million. 
we are told here that the recovery amount of the asset was 18 million, that one, and figure out whether there, there was an impairment loss or not. Now, checking here, we find that we cannot recover what we have recorded. We have recorded 24 million, but we can recover only 18 million. That indicates uh, the impairment loss of the difference, which is 6 million, just like that. So is at that point, uh, we know that the asset is, uh, has to be written down by 6 million. So we we'll credit the asset by 6 million and uh, debit the statement of profit or loss and expense of 6 million. That's why we say here, the asset is written down to 18 million and the impairment loss of 6 million is charged with the statement of profit or loss, just like that. So after performing this impairment review, we presume a, a new value of 18 million is our new deemed cost. And so we continue depreciating it based on the remaining years. So that's why we are told here, the depreciation charge per annum in the future periods would be this figure. How was it obtained? We took 18 million divided by the remaining years. You know, the use of life was 10 years, but two years have passed and we remained with eight years. So 18 million over eight, you obtain 2.25 million, just like this, and we, we are done. So right after this one, we proceed. We are further told that we are further told that at the first December, which is three years later, the circumstances which caused the original impairment to be recognized have reversed, and now the recovery amount is 40 million. So since the recovery amount is 40 million, uh, we proceed here now. You take uh, your, your, your new cost now. At the first December 2023, you minus the accumulated depreciation for three years. So accumulated depreciation would be 2.25 million depreciation per year times three, which would give you a six million seven fifty thousand. And subtracting the two, you will end up with a carrying amount of eleven million two fifty thousand. Now you compare a carrying amount to the recovery amount. The recovery amount is 40 million here. This uh, indicates, shows you obviously that there is no impairment loss. So no impairment loss. Actually, there is no impairment loss and there is an impairment reversal. Now what impairment reversal? You know, there is a cap here. Here there is a cap. The value could rise, but it should not exceed uh, the previous in, by the previous impairment loss. The previous impairment loss was 6 million. So if the difference is not above 6 million, you just increase your asset by that. If unless, otherwise, now to, to learn whether there has been an impairment or not, uh, you check now. We say that if you rise the value back, it should not exceed the historical depreciated, the depreciated historical cost. So we say here, there has been no impairment loss. In fact, there has been a reversal of the first impairment loss. Reversal because now we can recover more than the carrying amount. How? The asset can be reinstated to a new cost to what amount? To the maximum of the carrying amount at 31st December 2006, which is the time we are speaking about, had there never been an earlier impairment loss. So it's just simple. You consider what would have been if impairment had never occurred. If impairment had never occurred, you know, the carrying amount at the first December 2006 would have been much different. Let's say you would have a cost. Initially, we had a cost at, the, at first January 2002, we had a cost of 30 million. And then, you know, five years have passed. Since uh, 1st January 2002 to 31st December 2006, five years have passed. And so the accumulated depreciation would be 30 million over 10. This is depreciation for one year. Multiplying by five, we get the accumulated depreciation that is 15 million. After this, you would take the difference and have a carrying amount of 15 million. And this is the maximum restatement your asset, uh, which now has a carrying amount of 11,250,000 cannot be increased beyond this figure. But also it cannot be increased beyond that previous impairment loss that was 6 million. So simply speaking, if we just compare, you compare 6 million, which was the previous impairment loss. Let's take a look at it. 6 million here, which was the previous impairment loss 
and then compare it with this difference. 15 million, which is the new carrying amount, minus the carrying amount uh, in the books, which is 11 million 250, gives you the reversal of impairment loss of 3.75 million. But this reversal is only allowed if it does not exceed the previous impairment, and the previous impairment was 6 million. So we could use it all. So that's why we say here the reversal of the loss is recognized by increasing the asset by. 3.75 million and recognizing a gain of 3.75 million in profit or loss. Why? This is because actually the value was not above 6 million. That's why we say here, it should be noted. It should be noted that the whole 6 million original impairment cannot be reversed because actually we can only increase by 3.75. Let me tell you uh, the simple way. After here, compare the reverse of impairment loss and compare with the original impairment. Take the lesser. So increase the value of your asset by the lesser amount. Just like that. So 3.75 million is less than 6 million. So we increase it by 3.75. So the impairment can only be reversed to a maximum of the amount of the depreciated historical cost. I think we did this already based upon the original cost and the estimated use of life of the asset. So do not use the revised estimated life. So we'll do it that way. And uh, actually everything would be over. And so uh, in the next question, we could say that what, 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 what would have been, suppose let's say the asset was uh, under revaluation model. If the asset was revaluation model and there was a previous revaluation, things would have been much different, much, much different. Of course, I will see the example for that, but for now, we could take a look here. We could take a look at this point here. We could do this for now. Uh, as I said, uh, you have to raise your value of the asset by 3.75 million, and then you will have to credit a uh, impairment to base the statement of profit or loss as an income. And this would be income 3750, then 000, just like this. This would be your double entry. I hope all is well, and I hope to see you again uh, in the next example that uh, considers uh, evaluation, checking for these revaluations when it comes to uh, revalued assets, assets under evaluation model. How do we go about that? So thank you very much and continue watching us and subscribe and share to others. Thank you.